Daniel, as far as it goes with net violations, what is the interpretation of the rule for New York State? Uh, the interpretation is that a net is called as long as you touch the net uh, within the antennas in the action of playing the ball is considered a net. So uh, if, I'm, if, if, I'm a, if I'm a hitter and I go up and hit the ball and I follow through into the net, I'm still in the action of playing the ball. So a net should be called. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm transitioning away, so let's say a blocker goes up and uh, you know, the, the, uh, the attack goes above the fingers, they come down and they're moving away from the net and get ready for the next play. If they happen to brush it into the net, then we consider that the, the play had terminated, then this is not a net. So any part of the net is a net, as long as you are in the process of playing the ball. So if the ball is on the left side of the, of the net and somebody touches the net on the right side and they're not interfering with the play, that's not considered a net, basically. So you have to be in the action of playing the ball for the net to be considered a foul. And if you're transitioning away from the net, it's no longer a net. Gotcha. Lon, the same thing for New Jersey, similar rule? No. Uh, New Jersey is actually a net is a net is a net. So it doesn't matter if you're part of the action of the play or not. Um, if you hit the net, the body of the net and even the cables attached to the standards, it, it, it's a call and a, a fault violation. Understood. So I, I think this is um, a, a really big interpretation. And I'm sure Tim can jump in here too in a little is, you know, USA and New York rules outside the antenna is not necessarily a net or is not a net, but in New Jersey it is. Is that correct, Londa? Correct. So you have antennas that are within the body of the net, but with uh, New Jersey, it's not only the, within the antennas, but it's outside the antennas for the whole body, and then including the cables that attach the net to the pole. Okay, but that does not include the pole or the ref stand, is that correct? It does not include the ref stand or the poles abe. If someone hits the poles hard or hits the ref stand, that can constitute a dangerous play and it would be whistled as a net violation. Understood, good. Tim, uh, USA rules as far as net violation goes. This gets a little tougher, I think. The, the big difference between USA Volleyball and NCAA and New York rules, um, all, all the parameters are the same in, in those in those uh, those uh, forums. The thing that's different with us is that we have junior uh, officiating teams. Um, in in the high school and college, obviously there are two professional uh, referees who are a little more versed in what part of the play is, in in judging whether or not uh, a net should be called. So sometimes we get a little bit of uh, of variance in, in how things are called. Understood. So I guess little things that I think parents or coaches should understand just to re-go over to is um, if my ponytail hits the net, um, I assume in all levels this is not a violation just for our parents that may not know. Daniel, is that correct? That is correct. The hair against the net is not considered a, a violation. Okay. Um, what about uniform? In uh, Londa, in New Jersey, if my uniform hits the net, is that a violation? That is a violation uh, along with equipment. So, for, for example, if you have a towel um, tucked in, if that hits the net, that's considered equipment, um, and that would be considered a violation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Tim, where does USA stand on towels, uniforms, jewelry, ponytails? Uh, a, a ponytail is not a net. Uniform is, but who really watches that close? Mm -hmm. <laughs> fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. Good deal. So I, no, thank you for that. I, I appreciate those interpretations uh, and those rule, um, uh, you know, rule definitions. So the next one is kind of, you know, also within the same realms of faults and fouls is the centerline violation, um, which um, is kind of in that same group as we just said. So, Londa, as far as the centerline violation in New Jersey high school goes, um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, with NFHS, if your foot is completely over the center line, it is called. Um, you can do what they call shadow, where a part of your foot touches the um, opposite court. That's fine 
if you were able to step down and now part of your foot's on the line. So that, and that's what they call shadowing the line, the, the sh center line. Um, so with New Jersey, if there is a center line violation where your foot goes completely under and, and uh, no part of your foot's on the center line, it is a center line violation. Gotcha. Daniel, same question as far as center line goes in New York? Uh, uh, well, we do have a state notification there. For the girls, we follow the same procedure as interference and safety issue. So you can go across the center line as long as you're not causing a, a safety or you're not interfering with the play. Uh, that's not a violation. Uh, for the state, uh, there's a modification for the boys, whereas if you go completely across, then uh, automatically it's a center line violation, whether there's a safety issue or, a, uh, uh, or uh, an interference issue. Gotcha. And Tim, same question, center line violations for USA. So long as some part of your body remains over your own court, you're fine unless you're uh, causing a, a, a distraction to play or a, a safety issue. Good to know. So there is obviously a, a small modification or I don't know, an amendment to this rule as far as the pursuit rule goes. I don't wanna get into that in this discussion. Uh, if you wanna know what the pursuit rule is, please go look it up and I'm sure you will be impressed by it. And when it happens, it's a beautiful thing, but it doesn't happen very often. And most of the time it presents a safety risk and isn't even allowed. So talk to your officials before the match even starts if you wanna try. Um, with that said, uh, as far as centerline violations, the other part of this that I think I wanted to talk about was, um, and I just lost the train of my thought as far as centerline violations. And I guess I'm gonna end the show here because I totally lost the train in what question I was gonna ask. Could, so, could, it, could it have been interference? Yes, thank you. Two, right. two feet on the center line. Yes, so let me, so what I'll do is I'll restart and maybe Aaron can cut that part out. Um, so, <laughs> I love it. So one of the um, things I always am curious about in this is when two players both have rights to the ball and possibly could uh, touch each other under the net, land on the center line, you know, feet on top of feet. Um, how do you know as an official um, to call this interference, a dangerous play, a dangerous situation, um, you know, do, does sometimes this happen and there's not much we can do about it within the sport? You know, how does, how does that go as far as who claims the center line in that situation? Tim, do you have, um, you know, anything to say about that? Well, the center line is a two inch piece of tape or paint across the, uh, the court under the net. <clears throat> and if a player is on the, uh, on the center line, there is no, no chance to interfere with the opponents. Two, two players on opposite sides feet, both on uh, the, uh, the center line, but not over. There's no interference. If some part of a player's foot is over, but still over the center line, that's not necessarily a fault. But if that action prevents the other side from being able to play a ball, then, uh, then interference would be called. Fair enough. Daniel, same interpretation on the high school side, or it's a little safer in this case, or I'm not sure. Yes, it, it is the same. They do share the center line. We're talking about girls now. Uh, they do share the center line. They both have rights to that center line as long as one is not interfering with the other in terms of going to play the ball. Uh, so if they land on each other, uh, it is okay. If somebody is trying to make the next play and you're preventing that from happening, then it becomes a center line violation. Okay. Not the same question. Any interpretations on, in the New Jersey side? Same thing in New Jersey, and it, I think if anything, a lot of times some people feel um, the person that foots down first is the one that's creating the interference, but that's not necessarily so. Either one can still create the interference, and or they can both step down on each other and no, no interference. Mm -hmm. um, so if neither players are hindered from playing the next ball, then play continues. Awesome. Thank you for those interpretations. And hopefully that clears up a lot on that side too, because I feel like a lot of times in volleyball, if you see, you know, players connect from up other sides of the nets, you know, something has to be called and that's not always necessarily <laughs> the case. So I appreciate that. Thank you very, very much. And this is another edition of Jeeva Live. Have a great night.